the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical psychology for today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, narrated by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from Seeker After Truth by Idris Shah. This audio is made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. Who can learn? Question. Again and again, the Sufis claim that people do not register truth and that the ordinary mind is not reliable. But surely all our knowledge of life and of ourselves is based on a reliable understanding of facts. Surely Sufis are only talking about a minority of people. If they are, why bother with them? Answer. On the contrary, Sufis are talking here about a majority of people. It is interesting to note that it is only lately that others are catching up with this very great problem. I call it a problem because if it is true that people ordinarily are prone to considerable mistakes in perception and understanding, and are easily misled by wrong information, then this stands, as the Sufis say, as a barrier to real understanding. This has been demonstrated again and again. On television, in one program as an example, it was shown that people hardly ever know what they have seen. As eyewitnesses, humans are in the disaster class. From 525 questions asked of witnesses to staged events, only 52, 1 in 10, were correct and this from a selection of people who had been alerted to watch for something and still could not see it. The social consequences might include people being imprisoned on inaccurate eyewitness testimony. The consequence for the perception of things which are there in a higher sense are what the Sufis talk about. This opens the question of who can learn and what is a student. Again, people ask for truth, but advertisers have shown that truth does not sell goods. A study presented before the American Marketing Association showed that truthful advertisements fail, but lying ones succeed in putting people into a buying mood. In supposedly religious matters which have been shown to be early examples of advertising, the same picture emerges. The Glastonbury legends in which, among other things, Christ himself appeared and dedicated a church, are only one example. Supposed to start from AD 63, the scheme was in reality started as a fundraising ploy in 1184, 1,121 years after the supposed events, by the monks whose buildings had been destroyed by a fire. Does anyone believe that supposed events of over a thousand years ago, first published today as true fact, should receive any credence? This human tendency has actually been tested. The BBC Two television man Tony Bilbo hoaxed viewers by saying that he had obtained film clips of The Great Pismo and showed forgeries of the film. Then, Everybody began to remember the great Pismo when he made his television debut. Letters piled into the BBC praising the 1920s comedian. A woman wrote enthusiastically, My aunt was a great fan of the great Pismo. She saw him at a show in Hastings. She added, What a pity he was not recognised on television before she died in 1957. One man even sent in photographs of the great Pismo's father. After all that, could one doubt that he ever existed? It is precisely because of the unreliability of vision, of memory, of wanting to believe, of induced belief, whether in religion, in motor accidents, or in the lives of invented individuals, that the Sufis say that an objective perception must be acquired before even familiar things can be seen as they are. What do you really know? 
Question. The sensitivity of people towards animals must surely help them to understand higher things, especially the ability of animal lovers to perceive directly the ways of their pets. Answer. That is quite true. However, before you attribute this ability to all animal lovers, consider what a number of cat fanciers thought about cats. They were asked, 1. Are cats lone animals? 2. Do they form gangs, especially the males? 3. Do dominant males challenge others for the favours of the females? 4. Do they invariably react against intrusion of other cats into their territory? 5. Do dominant cats try to drive weaker ones from the latter's territory? And 6. Are some domestic cats unable to kill? Out of these six questions asked from a hundred cat fanciers, each person got every answer wrong. The answers, by the way, are questions 1, 3, 4 and 5, no, questions 2 and 6, yes. This research by Professor Paul Lehauser of the West German Max Planck Institute showed that people may think that they know about animals, but do they? Similarly, what people think that they know, even thinking that they know it by observation and even experience about other things, such as psychological and religious matters, can often be seen to be fragmentary, misplaced, selectively adopted. If people could rely upon themselves to learn by themselves, they would not need teaching. They wouldn't even need scientific verifications of fact to correct them, because their beliefs would be based on accurate information, since they would either observe correctly from the beginning or else reject inaccurate information. So before we get to the point of the value of the knowledge, we must be sure that it is really there. Human Nature Question The Sufis often condemn heedlessness, irrelevance and confusion and insist that these things have to be set aside since they interfere with higher perceptions, keeping people asleep for practical purposes. But are those characteristics manifested in ordinary life? And if they are, how do they affect us? If so, is this an analogy of the barriers to higher understanding? Answer I should have thought that any of these factors would interfere with the effectiveness of almost anything in ordinary life. But that they are part of ordinary human behaviour has been tested. A recent example is the nature of inventors and the characteristics of those whom they have to deal with in the matter of inventions. When the journal New Scientist carried out an investigation into the question, it was able to publish results which showed that this is a general human problem. The inventors were frequently irrelevant, confused and impatient. Some tried to patent inventions that nobody wanted because they were doing something which was already done. Some let their patents lapse. They wrote letters which could hardly be read, which dealt with divorce, illness, burglary and surgery, as well as the invention supposedly under discussion. Sometimes, when asked about one invention, they would answer about another. They changed their addresses without informing the patent's office, so they could not be contacted. The reaction to inventions was just as bad, or worse. Major official and other entities completely misunderstood inventions, although they were supposed to be evaluating them. Some organisations did not like them when they had not been carried out by their own staff. Some people liked inventions but did not believe that they would work, though they could not say why. Some of the reasons why inventions were turned down were obviously absurd. One invention which saves lives after cardiac arrest, for instance, was disliked because the release of an air valve made a hissing sound. 
The minister at the Department of Health completely misunderstood one remarkable invention to prevent suicide or accidental death through introducing emetics into tablets. People felt that their empire would be threatened by the acceptance of an outside invention. The press preferred lamenting the increase in car thefts to featuring an invention to frustrate them. And in the case of the same invention, everyone approached thought it so simple that it could not work. Here we have the classic working of the major human, normal methods of thinking and acting, or not acting. Laziness, stupidity, incredulity, fear of upsetting the status quo, obstructionism, timidity, irrelevance and confusion, and so on. It should be remembered that when the ordinary human being is approached with an idea, or series of ideas, or a teaching, he or she will often respond in just this same way. It is because of this that people with new things to say have resorted to arousing the greed of whomever they are approaching. This succeeds in increasing the greed and preventing the development of any side of the character or of the proposal which is not connected with greed. There is not only an analogy with higher understanding here. Before we get to that, we have to deal with the barriers erected by the lower understanding, which often cannot be described as understanding at all. The Sufi perception of these problems has been continually and solidly represented for centuries. The Sufi activity is designed to get past these barriers by the methods indicated to outmaneuver the commanding self, which is the complex of reactions involved when presenting advanced ideas to ordinary people and organizations. This experience with an easily studied area of human activity startlingly illustrates how humanity is asleep. New Knowledge from Old Question. By what method do the Sufis extract information of value to present-day psychology, to present-day psychology and higher knowledge, from ancient written materials? For my own part, I can only see the ordinary meaning in such texts. Answer. This is an interesting question, and the only way to answer it is to say that one has to have specialised knowledge and also experience. But it may be possible to make the process clearer by means of an analogy. Assume that there is a water source which seems unexpectedly to be harming crops. An expert is called in, and he realises that there is zeolite in the water and that it is no longer active. He also knows that salt can regenerate it by means of the following formula. Calcium zeolite plus 2 sodium chloride gives sodium zeolite plus calcium chloride. He adds salt to the water and the phenomenon of ion exchange is achieved. So we need a chemist. Now, if you are still with me, consider the following passage from the Old Testament, from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 19 to 21. And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, and as my Lord seeth, but the water is naught, and the ground barren. And he said, Bring me a new cruise, and put salt therein and they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters, and cast the salt in there, and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters, there shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. It is difficult to imagine that Elisha is not demonstrating chemical knowledge in performing iron exchange, if you did not know something about chemistry, the story might make an interesting read about a miracle. On the other hand, if you did, it makes, for some at least, an even more interesting account of information. You may be interested to know that the chemical nature of this biblical tale, reaching beyond its supposed miracle status, was analysed by Professor Yahya Hashmi, 
an illustrious scientist and Sufi authority, of the Aleppo Society for Scientific Research in Syria in 1962. Floor Covering Question. I was interested to read in the press that you are reported as having said that institutions, far from giving a guarantee of rationality because they are subject to assessment and measurement, equally often, or more frequently, enshrine irrationality. But surely, whereas a quasi-institution like a commercial company may behave eccentrically because of the wishes of, say, the directors, this is not the case in more coherent bodies like government departments, where there is a public check. Answer. The tendency is everywhere. Rather than my wasting your time with numerous examples, I think that it would be worth your while to seek such anomalies yourself. They are to be found in the newspapers if you have no direct contacts to supply them. Here is just one. The New Scientist reported on the 29th of March 1979 that the following figures had been given in the British Parliament for the underfoot floor covering supplied by the government for various kinds of people in its employ. Typists, £25. Clerical officers, £30. Senior executive officers, £67. Under secretaries, £181. Deputy secretary, £290. There is no evidence that deputy secretaries' office floors get harder treatment than under secretaries. Indeed, there is nothing to show that such carpets are harder wearing, only that they are more expensive. We all know, of course, that a better carpet is a hallowed privilege and that people are reprimanded for using their own rugs if this seemed to indicate a higher status. But where does the rug as an indicator of status connect with the rationality expected from an institution? Economics Question. Although, as we know, most Sufi activity down the ages has been private rather than public, and Sufis do not primarily wish to attract attention to themselves, there is undoubtedly evidence of a massive investment of people and resources in Sufi teaching. Apart from the scholars, who are subsidised by universities, and the cultists, who are self-financing as they grow in numbers, there are the Sufi activities which appear full-blown and which are always seen to be immensely efficient and well-funded. What makes it worthwhile for the Sufis to engage in such enormous investments? Answer. Sufi activity is, of course, to be expressed more in terms of less impressive-looking things than material investment. But as you have raised the matter, you might care to look at it in this way, by pursuing your own line of thought. We can take the smallpox eradication program of the United Nations as an equivalence. This started in 1968 and lasted for a decade. The United States alone contributed $2.6 million a year towards the effort, $26 million over the 10 years in which the disease was eliminated. Now, many people imagined that this money was lost, was of the nature of charity to the third world, and some wondered whether it could not be better used in the USA itself. Why do we spend such massive sums on people who often don't behave properly, it was asked. Dr. L. B. Brilliant of the World Health Organization's Smallpox Eradication Program, however, has revealed that the United States of America alone gains over $300 million each year in savings on her protection of the American people against smallpox. Others calculate the saving as being in excess of $450 million, again annually. So your word investment is correct. Sufis invest partly to protect the people against the absence of Sufic activity and consequent impoverishment of the people and partly in order to inoculate the people against cults and conditioning, 
and partly to bring the advantages of the Sufi enterprise to the people who can benefit from them. Similarly too, people who contribute to Sufi entities also help to prevent things getting worse, and they also help to make it impossible for things ever to be as bad again as they once were. Invention versus Development Question. British people constantly complain that, although they invent some of the most wonderful things, they hardly ever develop them, and the result is that technical devices all over the world are of British origin, while engineers and scientists of other nations adapt and market them. What can be done about this, and what is its relevance to higher human capacities? Answer. I have heard this constantly, about antibiotics, about jet engines, about hovercraft, and so on. People love to complain about it in speeches, and it is part of a refrain seen in the newspapers. The implication is that if one could only develop a better planning and vision sense, all would be well. Before looking at this problem, I think that it is worth paying attention to what an Englishman said after considering the whole phenomenon. He told me, A Frenchman, a German and an Englishman were being taken to be hanged. The Frenchman was first, and the trapdoor did not work. He was reprieved on the grounds that nobody could be hanged twice. Fate had intervened. The same thing happened to the German. As the Englishman was being taken for his turn, he was asked if he had any last words. Yes, he said, you need a bit of grease on the hinges. The joke itself is remarkably diagnostic of the mentality in question. The man knows what should be done, but is unable to relate it to his own needs. He is unable, too, to keep his mouth shut, even when his life is at stake. This, in turn, highlights the problem. If human beings are dependent upon invention and the development of inventions without any question as to what kinds of inventions, when and where, would be of any far-reaching value, then those who invent will have to learn how to develop, and those who develop should also learn to invent, if this kind of thing is to be kept going satisfactorily to such a mechanistic view of life. But what about the matter of what kind of inventions and what kind of development? For this, higher knowledge is necessary. Deterrent Question. I can't understand how it can be true that real Sufi teachings contain elements which deter unsuitable people from going deeper into the subject on a deliberate basis. Surely the intention of the Sufis, like that of everyone having something good to share, is to interest as many people as possible and to improve people by means of their literature, not to deflect them. Answer. People are always writing to other people claiming that they can't understand this or that. Now if they do not understand it, this is merely a statement of the reader's condition. It is not a question. If, on the other hand, the individual means that he does not want to believe it, we might try to give an answer. I choose to interpret this question in that way. On the social level, People often make themselves obnoxious to others to prevent them from trying to become too friendly, if they do not like them. Do you imagine that something which can operate on such a crude level cannot be worked on a higher one? Rumi, for instance, constantly assails scholars and shows them up as much more stupid than they imagine themselves to be. This deters few scholars. They continue to write and lecture about Rumi and his work but it gives the ordinary person an opportunity to see the absurdity of the situation, scholars repeating their own shortcomings and continuing to do Rumi's work after 700 years. In assuming that the Sufis want to share and interest as many people as possible, you are confusing them with enthusiast cultists and people who count heads. The Sufis want to share 
but they have to share with those who can profit from the sharing and can therefore continue the process of sharing with others to come. This requires the Sufis using their energy in teaching how to learn before any sharing can take place. Sharing the sheer sensation of importance or of being a human being or even a servant of humanity can be done by anyone and is the sort of sharing that people are always straining towards. But the minimum human duty is to serve others. It is no great attainment. Feeling important is a vice, not a virtue, however concealed as participation in something noble. Finally, note what New Jersey park officials in the USA have done with Christmas trees. So many people were stealing them that they are now sprayed with a chemical which gives off an offensive smell when the tree is put in a warm place. Thieves learn to avoid these trees for this reason. If this can be done with plants, why not with books? And in the case of a book, or a man's behaviour even, you don't have to ruin the book or waste the man's contact, as you have to ruin the Christmas trees of New Jersey, to teach the can't-understanders a lesson. Cause and Effect Question. Why do Sufis sometimes do inexplicable things? I have heard of them forbidding people to eat certain food, or telling them to go to certain places, or even saying outrageous things which people puzzle over for years. Answer. Imitators do these things to impress. Real Sufis do them because of a knowledge of cause and effect. Most people have no idea that the most trivial-seeming actions may have extremely far-reaching effects. Only occasionally are cause and effect seen in a short run within a contracted time scale, giving an equivalence of what we are talking about. There is the case, to take one almost at random, of the wine and the finger. The French playwright Victorien Sardou was sitting at table during a dinner when he upset a glass of wine. A lady by his side, to prevent the liquid staining the cloth, poured salt on it. Spilt salt to some people means bad luck. To counteract this, a pinch is thrown over the shoulder, and Sadhu did just this. The salt got into the eyes of the waiter who was trying to serve him, and the chicken on the plate which he held fell to the ground. The dog of the house started to gobble the chicken, and a bone lodged in its throat so that it began to choke. The hostess's son tried to get the bone out of the dog's throat. Now the dog turned on the youth and bit his finger so hard that it had to be amputated. The waiter, the dog and the son of the house were all acting automatically through the secondary self, a mixture of greed, hope, fear and conditioning. Only the woman acted for practical reasons, but her attempt to retrieve the situation was foiled by the playwright, whose second action, throwing the salt over his shoulder, set the whole train of actions going. False Masters Question. Why are there so many false spiritual teachers around? Answer. This is one of the most common questions, and there are almost as many answers as there are people asking. When there is a true or useful thing, there is sure to be a counterfeit. This does not mean that the original intention was bad, but things turn out bad if they are not properly organised. There is no difference between this problem and the one of the lovelorn Taiwanese. There was once a young man of Taiwan who desperately desired that a certain girl should marry him. He wrote her letters over a period of two years an average of one a day, declaring his love. This continued, says the United Press, from 1972 to 1976. Without that effort, it is unlikely that the lady would have become engaged, in the way she did, to the postman who delivered the letters. Troubadours Question 
I have heard it said repeatedly that such groupings as the troubadours were engaged in religious enlightenment programs, but I cannot see how. After all, they were amusing people with their songs and poems. Surely this is part of what you have called the entertainment industry, and would not bring anyone to enlightenment any more than sacred dances or self-centred prayer. Answer. There is a restaurant in New York to which a kind friend took me. The waiters there entertain the children with balloons and songs and doing a Pied Piper act around the tables. Does this make anyone imagine that they are not waiters at all? A moment's observation shows that, in addition to this entertainment function, they are indeed workers, bringing food to the tables. The fact is that Sufi activities may contain entertainment value, but they have something else as well, just as an orange has flavour and nutrition. This is not widely understood only because people are in fact looking for entertainment, or else to denigrate it, they are not looking for fact. Here is a tale which may fix this in your mind. A man used to stand outside the window of a beautiful girl, playing the guitar and serenading her. Someone asked, Why do you not ask her to marry you? He said, I have thought of that, but if she agreed, what would I do with my evenings? This podcast is copyright 2018, the Idris Shah Foundation.